Welcome to Tuesdays with Andrea. It's the inspiration station for everyday people guiding humanity forward. I'm your host, Andrea Rios McMillan, and every week I pursue conversations that matter with people who can relate to the common struggles we all face. You'll get to know the person behind the profession and find commonality with people of all ages, cultures, and backgrounds. Listen as friends, neighbors, and coworkers offer meaningful, personal explorations of modern life and the values we hold dear, all for the purpose of strengthening and uplifting others. Welcome everyone to Tuesdays with Andrea podcast. I am so excited for uh, this next guest. I'd say every guest is special because every guest is special to me. Uh, But Dr. Adrienne Holloway is unique in that she's a a phenomenal community builder, a leader, an activist, um, and also just a strategist and a personal friend and someone that I consider a mentor and someone that I, I certainly look up to when it comes to um, personal, like talking about personal things and then professional. I think uh, she plays such a pivotal role. So I'm excited for you guys to meet her. Welcome, Adrian, to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. I'm sure everyone who listens to your podcast and watches your viewing is already a big fan of yours. But if there are anyone, there's anyone new on this, just know Andrea is amazing. And I am so proud of her to always look at ways in which to expand her influence. And this podcast series was something she had thought about for a while. And when she finally launched it, I was just ecstatic. So oh. Continue to follow her and listen to her, not only because of the guests, but because of the insight that she provides. She's awesome and a great and mother. Thank you, Adrian. And so let me give a, a background on, you know, some of the work that you do. So Adrian is Chief Innovation Officer for the City of Aurora, and you're responsible for identifying opportunities to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the government operations. Um, and then you also have... Um, uh, you oversee the city of Aurora's community services and information technology divisions, which is so cool. Um, And so this is a role that you've done for the last, what, two years or so, maybe three, Three, yes. Three years. I think we're, uh, yeah. And then prior to that, you were a DePaul university professor at uh, the graduate school of public service. And you literally taught government and community development and building and research methods. And I'm interested in talking to you about all of those roles, about how you were able to, um, as an educator, transition into government and what your, what your um, school of thought is for everyday people being able to become more aware and also help you know, build community in their own ways. So I'm, I'm happy that you're on and I can't wait to, to dig in. All right. So let's start with um, your current role at the city of Aurora and what is it like for you? Um, I guess I want to just a little, maybe a bit more of a backstory because um, I really, I would say came into this role having had experience in being, really being a community developer. So even yeah. before academia, most of my career had been in community organizing and community development. So that's where my heart has always been. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I've worked in usually resource poor communities. So I started out in New York, I'm originally from New York. So I worked in Manhattan and the Bronx uh, with social service and community and economic development organizations in those communities. And then moved out to LA and that's where I actually worked in public housing um, on the East side in a major redevelopment program. And I would say I became more uh, um, versed in municipal government in its application of community development Mm -hmm. through that job. So it it continued to kind of build my skill set. But I've always been um, interested, and I guess even beforehand, but interested in the teaching part, the teaching skill sets in community development and in nonprofit um, in particular, Mm -hmm. then government kind of came in. So I've always looked at opportunities to potentially teach, and I was able to get one because I moved to Houston, still doing community development, and then was hired to be a faculty member at a new community college. So teaching government was what was required as a, a requisite course or a core course at the community college level, but I wanted to add more nuance 
Mm -hmm. because I knew that government in its traditional academic sense really wasn't government in its execution, real world sense. Mm -hmm. And the students who came in, I wanted them to know when you um, are understanding government, it's got to be understood at a personal level, as yeah. a, at advocacy level, and then as a, a public service level, which is government. So my courses always had kind of breadth. So I brought all of that into teaching. So now I get to take that, that experience back into government and create something new, which is, which was the innovation and core services department. So I've always felt, and you know, talking to my husband when we were, I was even considering the, the offer, yeah. leaving a tenure track position isn't an easy thing to do, especially if, if you worked in And this was in Houston. At, in, no, in, in um, DePaul. Oh, DePaul. Was, oh, yes. Okay. So you started in the Bronx mm-hmm. in New York. Mm-hmm. That's where you were raised. Then you built your community building in New York. And then you moved to California for the public housing. And then Houston for a little bit and then you came here to Illinois and which is where you taught at DePaul um, and then you were tenured there and you chose to give up your tenure for public. I wasn't tenured public- yet. I was going oh, up not- for tenure okay. that year. So that what I- was that discussion like? <laughs> what did your husband say? <laughs> <laughs> like, girl, you I, worked your whole, this is your whole career for this. Well, I, that was what I was saying. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> you know. I worked my um, whole career for this. This wasn't easy to, to get to this point. And it's a lot that you have to do. And anyone in academia knows um, being an assistant professor and working towards tenure is a lot of work. It's post-tenure when things kind of relax a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, he was the one that kind of shared that insight. Like, Adrian, if you look back on your career, everything that you've done kind of led to this. I mean, you're pulling all of that experience, the community development, community organized, the public sector, and then academia, and and really pulling it all together into this um, new opportunity. Mm -hmm. And it's not that there's gotta be a level of permanency that I have to stay at the city of Aurora. There's probably, God's gonna open another door and I'm gonna go there, but he was the one to help me make sense of it. Wow. And even if I wanted to go back to academia, I can maybe in a different um, position or role, but I can't. Mm-hmm. So, but it, you know, it took a, it was a lot of back and forth. Though I, I wasn't easily sold on you yeah. know his insight, and then I said, okay, you're you know, it makes sense and it'd be exciting, and it gives me a chance to kind of look to see everything that I was teaching. I was teaching grad school, so I'm teaching masters um, in public administration, who are pretty much the people who are going to. The positions of city manager and city um, administrative officers. I said, well, am I still in touch with you know, what's happening at the local level and what I'm teaching in the classroom still relevant? Yeah. I'll be out, I'm going to be out there and kind of testing the water. So it's really been exciting to kind of look at my role and know what would I maybe taught differently or maybe, hey, you know, surprise, some of this stuff is really still applicable. Yeah. Because you actually, this was your expertise. This was the the, the field in which you have academic study of. Mm-hmm. Um, and to be able to now apply it in a different way, how has that changed the way that you work and the way that you you view your team and the setup? Has it changed? Um, would you advocate for other people to do the same? Maybe who are positions of academic positions to be more active in, in local city affairs? I would say um, it, it depends on what your specialization or your degree is in um, or your academic route, but there's something in academia where you have kind of the, the scholars, the research scholars, and they really just focus on producing research for consumption among academics. Yeah. There are some who we call activist scholars who really produce research for use in the space to which you're focused on. So I've always couldn't consider myself an activist scholar, Mm -hmm. but even in, so I wanted to produce research that people can use to effectively change at the local level. So, you know, this is something that can help um, you if you look at it in in a particular context, but even in academia, because you have all these other responsibilities, there is the opportunity to become detached a bit and you focus too much on the theory and the hypotheses and and not so much of how much is really working unless you are always getting grants Mm -hmm. so to me this was a great opportunity to kind of look at this job as this on the ground 
test of you know, what what are the issues? Are they still like pertinent issues that I'm talking about in, cl- in the classroom or I'm researching or have they changed or have they shifted? Yeah. And I think today, some of the things that I used to teach in the classroom that's really kind of elevated in our national and not international dialogue from race and racial um, injustices and justices. Mm-hmm. I think um, it's still tied to what I, I taught and yeah. I think the time right now, it's, it's a bit different in terms of how it's being elevated, but the issues have been there. So, so what are some of, what are some of those issues and what are some of those, you know, research um, ideas that you based off of your experience will really help move that conversation forward or move um, one of the, one of the main questions um, that I'm, I'm focusing right now is how do we help a hurting nation heal, right? When we think about the racial injustice, systemic injustice, and we think of even um, coronavirus and fear, people living in fear and uh, dealing with economic downturn and uh, not having a job, there's so much right now of a pain and hurt and, and confusion and chaos, I would say. What are those things from a community building perspective or policy perspective in, in, in local spheres that we can um, address that would really help us now? And from what you've, you know, researched and saw and taught from your um, angle, do you have any, what's your perspective on that? I think it's, it's gotta be multifaceted, Andrea. And when I um, talk to people who are interested in, in, effectuating some level of change and and that was before all of this right? yeah. some of the problems that we have are so um, entrenched and multifaceted so there really there never is that one program that one idea that one thing is going to solve it all yeah. but that so that in of itself can be overwhelming yeah. so or freeing I, you know right um, depending on how you, you approach it. So I think, well, I would say what we are experiencing now is just this culmination, like you said, of all of, of, of this stuff you know, coming to a, a point. So how do we, I love the way that you put it, how do we help people heal? It's, it has to recognize the, the individual, the personal part of this, and it has to recognize the policy. And those are two very different things that mm-hmm. require a different kind of intervention, different level of just a different opportunity to engage. Yeah. So when it, so I, I focus a lot more on the policy piece. Yep. And what I've seen now is a real um, galvanized interest, if not push, for policy change. And but I, I think it's coming at a point at a level where people are may not always understand how that works. Mm-hmm. So there's this kind of gap in terms of this is what I want, to, but how do I get there? So then the village gap. Yeah. If we were to fill that with just information, like this is how policy is made. This is mm-hmm. how you change policy. This is how you can do stuff outside of government. This is how you do things uh, with government because it's in its purview. So it's kind of like an opportunity for a training ground because we have yeah. such interest there. That's where I see there's a like an insertion point for mm-hmm. policy. Because that's what people want now. Yeah. And, and then, then there's, basic education. Yeah. Like basic civics education. Like who do I go to in my local city? Who is the, you know, nonprofit group that I go to for uh, uh, nonprofit services, yeah. right? A lot of people don't know unless it's, you know, YWCA. We know the big names, but we don't know right. the small names. Right. But even there, you know, what are, where are their positions? What are they doing? What can they do? What they cannot do? It's also mm-hmm. understanding the organization themselves and where they're posturing, where they're positioning themselves as well in, in this narrative as far mm-hmm. as how they know what issues are because they're serving many of the clientele. Do they have that advocacy capacity too? So, um, you know, there's, I guess there's an insertion point when it becomes, so when I think of policy, it's not just government policy, it's also how the nonprofits interface here as well. Mm-hmm. And letting people know how to get engaged that way. Mm-hmm. And then the other part, the, the personal, the human part, how do we help? That's, that's the opportunity for communities to come together. And I think we, we see that. How do, and we've seen that with, 
the coronavirus. I mean, the fact that people are in compliance with all of the regs um, or the the, um, the limitations, if you will, of mm-hmm. our comings and goings in an effort to save ourselves or to protect ourselves, but to protect others. Mm-hmm. How do we how do we leverage that? Mm-hmm. Continue to build that community, and to me, that's that's when you look at the whole landscape of st- stakeholders. It's not government. I think government is probably the last area that you'd want to take the role, the lead in this. This is really the nonprofit organizations, the faith communities, the neighborhood groups that can do that work on a much smaller scale and just mm-hmm. building community and sharing. Um, to me, it's just, it's more time and, and information and resources, but at that intimate level, because mm-hmm. to me, that's what, you know, when you start ch- changing the way people interact with one another, that's more sustainable yeah. than it is to have a program that's just going to be kind of a, a, a shot in the dark and, and then move on. Mm-hmm. And that's what government really doesn't have the sustainability to focus on something like that, but it's necessary. Mm-hmm. And is it because government is, you know, there, there's life cycles, there's a, a turn rates and every four to eight years, there's different administration changes. Is it because there's more turnover there? Or do you think it's more, uh, the focus should be more on community based organizations, community led organizations, because they have more uh, flexibility, more nimble opportunity to build relationships and to directly connect with and help the communities that they are themselves part of. Is there differences there in, in terms of effectiveness and efficiency? Um, interesting. When I used to teach government, I used to always call, we had three branches of government, but I always say we had four because I would count the nonprofit organizations as that fourth branch of government because when we went from providing most of the direct services from government to the block grants. This is back in the eighties, the block grant system where we were going to outsource the work to nonprofit organizations. We then this government wasn't involved in as much. Mm -hmm. And even um, right now we don't provide a lot of those direct services, very limited. We contract out with nonprofits. So there's this, there is a level of financial efficiency associated with that relationship. But to me, it's more than that. And this is with the caveat that we are supporting the nonprofits the way we should. If we're asking them to do some work, that means that they should be able to have the financial um, underpinnings to to actually execute that work. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, they do have the, the opportunity to develop stronger relationships with one another which we like to, to see more of collaborations and yeah. operations, but also with their clientele. Yeah. So there's more time that could be spent there. That's just not taken away from the other responsibilities of government. And then government can focus on the public services that it's responsible for. So public safety services, your, your, utility services, um, your financial services, those are the things that as a, public good we're we're responsible for no one else is going to do that work nonprofit private sector right we are responsible for those public goods and we're stewards of the public good so we have to focus on that but it always has to be this partnership with Part- nonprofits so what made you uh lead thrive so you founded this initiative well you started this initiative which is the thrive organization and you started it within the current administration what made you start this and what First, let's start off with what is Thrive. Oh, what is Thrive, yeah. <laughs> what is Thrive? Thrive is it's the Thrive Collaborative Center, and it's an incubator slash co-working space for the social sector. So it's mm-hmm. nonprofit organizations and social entrepreneurs, so social businesses or, or entrepreneurs or for-profit businesses that have a social mission. That also works on making a profit as well, but their mission is social. So Thrive is this incubator co-working space for the nonprofits and the social entrepreneurs. And it's designed to help build a a stronger community of social uh, people or organizations in the social sector. So the incubator space, we provide a variety of different types of workspaces at below market costs so that they can in turn invest the savings that they would have incurred at the another type of space back into the growth of their organization. Mm -hmm. And 
the other part of it is the incubator space is providing them access to a variety of different resources that will help, again, strengthen their organization from workshops to small working groups to actually individual coaching mm-hmm. that they would receive at no additional cost. It's just part of their membership. Mm-hmm. And it's all designed to build what we hope to be this collaborative uh, working entity or or, a working infrastructure Mm -hmm. in the social sector where nonprofits are actually learning how to become more effective collaborators than just networkers and how that can change the whole landscape of of service provision in the area. And how has it been going? I know that COVID-19, you had your your grand opening right before COVID. And so, you know, people haven't been able to go to the, to the office. They haven't been able to gather and to really use that thought leadership space. So how have you guys been managing in, you know, in lieu of? In lieu of, well, um, we actually got some, we started off with some good traction. So we had a number of offices had already been leased and then we went on the shelter in place in, in March. But, um, We're at a position now where we actually received our last tenants. So all of our office space is leased. And last, as of last month, our our last offices were leased. So we're excited by the reopening because we'll have such an energy there. Yeah. And people are going to be waiting to go. They don't, they want to get out of their house now. I know, I'm sure. Right. (laughs) Um, And so we're just figuring out how to provide the other services. So we have still coaching that's available for both the, um, for-profit executives and the nonprofit executives. We're working on our second year of partnership with Northern Illinois University Center for Nonprofit and NGO Studies. So we will have people on staff or on site to provide coaching for nonprofits. We still partner with the Small Business Development Center, with SCORE, and with some other um, for-profit coaches to help our businesses grow. Mm-hmm. So we're looking at maybe hybrid models where we'll offer workshops that are We'll have a certain limited number of people in house and also provided um, simultaneously uh, via Zoom so that we can increase the population of participants. Mm -hmm. So there's, I think we are positioned really nicely to help provide the level of assistance that organizations and businesses are going to need in order to kind of emerge out of what we've been in for the last three months and what we may still be in from an economic perspective. So it's, it's, and then we have to figure out what our own reopening space is going to look like too and how to mod- modify it for yeah. compliance as well. So that's interesting. So when you brought the, the Thrive initiative to the mayor or to the board who approves the budget and things like that, how do you get buy-in for it? What is the, the process of saying, this is what we need and this is why we think it's a great idea to actualizing that and making it happen? What Did it happen in one year? Did it happen in two years? How does one do that, Adrian? With Thrive, that's, that was brand new. That was, there was nothing really to, to leverage there. So it was really, how do we make the case for this? And so it took about a year for mm-hmm. us to do the necessary research. Um, not only the research in our, we, we, it actually emerged just because we started talking to, to nonprofits here. We're, we're learning a, about their capacity and recognizing that you know, there's really opportunities for growth, but no one was really positioning them as a, as a support system to provide that growth. So we started thinking about Thrive in this conceptual way. And then it became a bit more real as we did more research on on nonprofit centers. And then we thought, why not bring in the social entrepreneurs? Because they could benefit as well. And this could be a Mm -hmm. unique um, partnership. One can learn from the other and vice versa. I mean, this is, so it was really just prototyping and thinking it through and then um, presenting it. And I would say, you know, with the mayor wanting this position, this was really something he wanted to have as part of his administration. He's been quite supportive of many of the things that we brought forward. Um, in, in concept now. So I'm just like, well, you got to get the money, Adrian. You got to figure out how to get the money. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of grant writing too mm-hmm. that helped, but Thrive came in at a time when we did get another grant. And that really was, I would say, the impetus to move Thrive forward uh, as an entity, asking for more money, uh, developing this uh, well thought out concept, but still working, a working concept because right. we, we needed to execute to figure out what are the areas that we didn't think about and we needed to think about or the areas that we need to grow because it made sense. It makes sense. Mm-hmm. 
but enough of a, a case to what we got the support from the financial. So those are those financial decisions, support from um, leadership and city council to say, yeah, you know, we, we should do this for our social entrepreneurs or our social sector. Mm-hmm. Because so, yeah. to your point, uh, the nonprofit space and the social sector space does play such an influential role. And they're also the group, I would say, that have the least coordination amongst each other, not in terms of working, not in terms of partnership, because I think they're, they're, they, they're very partnership heavy. But in terms of, you know, nonprofits don't report to anyone else other than their boards. Mm -hmm. And they don't really report to the city, they don't report to stakeholders. um, And so it's harder to come together and really have that thought leadership, unless you're in same industry or same space. But if you have um, a mentorship group over here providing one service, and let's say my tech nonprofit over here providing education service, how do we ever get those groups to meet on a local level um, and really find ways to work more collaboratively in the cities that we're in uh, with the local uh, players Mm -hmm. from a long-term perspective? I think that's where Thrive fits beautifully. I haven't seen a lot of other cities that have the same model or construct yet. So that's been our, our main idea with Thrive. It's how do we help organizations under move along this paradigm of, of collaboration and starting with what's familiar, which is networking, and then working that to be more of an effective networking experience. So it's more than just, oh, I'm going to go to this networking event and I'm going to go to that one and fill out my calendar with networking events and then yeah. not produce anything other than another business card in your role, of, you know, yeah, roll it another down. contact. Yeah. yeah. So it's helping them make the, the appropriate decisions on how they are best to use their time, finding the opportunity to develop a relationship so that partnerships can form. So you go from networking to a partnership to um, you know, a, a collaborative, a true collaboration when you're actually sharing resources and, mm-hmm. and sharing data. And that's all the way at this end, but there's got, there has to be a lot more that happens before you actually get there. Right. But when you get here, that means that your mentorship program and your IT training, they're working as collaboration. Remember we talked about how our issues are so multifaceted. They're so entrenched mm-hmm. and there's not going to be that one, one silver bullet that's going to answer it all. But if you start bringing these silver bullets together, and they're working with the same clientele. So you've got someone who's participating in IT training and also getting the benefits of mentorship through different organizations, sharing the resources, combined the investment in that person and that family or that entity is going to be so much greater yeah. than them operating separately. Mm-hmm. That to me is how you're able to really see a longer standing impact and um, change in a community Mm. when you're able to work together that way but it takes some time to get there and that's certainly the infrastructure that you're building is the space for that collaboration the people the resources Mm -hmm. from a city perspective to say hey we're we're committed to supporting you yeah right Mm -hmm. um i think it's fantastic i think it's fantastic so what is it that that you need what is it that you guys um, from an organizational perspective, are looking for from the community? Uh, do you know? Are are people engaged? Are you looking for engagement from individuals or or mainly other organization organization leaders? Um, who are the people that you you know are trying to engage in in thrive? I think we we have a variety of different ways we can engage people. That you know, the first part is. People are organizations, so they would be organizations, either businesses or nonprofits, becoming a member of Thrive, so they can participate in our participate in the resources that we are going to provide. So mm-hmm. we have um, both the office memberships, and we are creating actually just kind of um, traditional memberships where you don't, if you don't need a new office or a workspace, you can still uh, participate in our trainings and our small groups and our um, coaching at a different membership level. So we're creating that because there's been an ask for that. So that's kind of that. We want to implement this thing, but we know we're going to change it as we're getting feedback, um, which is what you do in innovation. You you prototype your test and you you throw it out there again. Um, And that's what Thrive is going to be for probably the first 
year and a half now. It's putting something out there. So being able to participate um, means that we are going to have the opportunity to influence some level of, of change in the organizations that we are designed to assist and partner. Um, and then there's the supporters. Those are the corporations that like what we're doing, that see the benefit of what we're doing, that want to continue, wants us to continue. We definitely can benefit from corporate support as well, just like mm -hmm. any other program. Um, we, we underwrite some of the costs through our general fund and we get some from our membership fees, but it's never, you know, never going to take over the general fund. So the, the less we have to rely on the general funds for support, because we got corporate support, the better off and the more sustained we would be. Yeah. So those are the two opportunities. And then our, our existing um, philanthropy, or philanthropy organization can definitely help us as well. And what are the challenges to being able to um, get to the place that you want to go? What are those major hurdles and roadblocks that you um, are learning or finding? Are there any? right now right now it's it's, it's if it wasn't for COVID, we probably have more to share um because we would have had more months under our belt right now it's awareness it's letting people know who you know, what thrive is and why we're here so that they can test us out and see if this is some place that they feel can help them grow yeah I think it's also um one of the challenges is you know understanding that the nonprofits, especially right now are going to be have been and will continue to be under a lot of stress and pressure yeah. to meet their own financial goals and meet the needs that they serve. Mm -hmm. So I would love, 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 love to see a corporate or a philanthropic donation that will cover the cost of an organization's membership to thrive. So that'd be one less expense that they would have to incur so yeah, a company, have. a corporate covering the cost, right? Because truly companies are saying we want to diversify. We want more thought leadership. We want more community activism. This is the perfect call to action, actually, right? Yeah. Put your money where your mouth is and cover the cost of a nonprofit to become a member, um, to become and build a more engaged community that can work collaboratively within the government that supports, you know, the local people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we have eight desks so we have desk memberships too um, so if anyone does need a, a space to work because they uh, are deciding that their current situation is probably cost prohibitive then those are opportunities too so there's a variety of ways that a nonprofit can be supported and um, I would love to see that I would love to okay. see that investment well okay so, so I like this and um, we're going we're gonna to highlight that call to action um, because I think it's a very tangible, realistic way to, to build community, but also support if you have the funds to do it for nonprofits who are struggling so much right now um, because fundings are cut and, and that's truly where a, a need is uh, and they have ability and capacity to be able to support people on, on a wider scale. Um, I will add that we... we as part of our model, we'll collect data as well. So there'll be metrics yeah. associated with the work that we do as we're moving organizations from their entrance to thrive to you know, when they're ready to leave, what, they, what their goals were, how they've achieved those goals, what their level of participation is in terms of access to resources. So if we, when we report out to city council, to the mayor, to any of our um, supporters, We'll report out the same kind of data that we'll be training our, our nonprofits to do as well. So switching gears really quick. Sure. Now I want to talk to you from a personal perspective, because I feel like this is equally as important to people like me. <laughs> <laughs> we just want to know what, what is Adrian's journey and story? Like, how did you, mm. from New York, travel across the, basically across, you know, you went West Coast, you went South, and then you came North. And... You still have, you have a family, you have a daughter who is doing phenomenal, um, but you're still rising through the ranks as a, as a working mom and community leader. And we didn't even talk about your being, you know, past chairman of, of Aurora Hispanic Heritage Advisory Board and your civic service there. We didn't talk about your strategy and, and, and helping with communication strategy with the, the, the last election for the city of Aurora and just kind of that mind to uh, be able to have forward 
vision and thinking, but then taking care of yourself in the process. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's not easy. And you're a a Latina, uh, Puerto Rican woman, right? That has to come with its own set of challenges Mm -hmm. and adversity. Um, Can you share some of that with us? Um, So I would start with why... (sighs) I guess how, what created this world for me, right? Like the way I, I, I viewed the world and my place in it. Um, so born in, in New York, in Harlem. So I was born in Harlem and in the projects in Harlem. And then we moved to the projects in the Bronx. And, you know, living in... Did those, you know you were in the projects? Oh, yeah, I knew I was in the projects. I Well, you know... Um, Yes. Well, that's because we've, we've referenced them as the projects. I always knew I lived in the projects. I think to, to take it away, and that's because we called it the projects. Yeah. And we knew where the projects were. But it's all the question is that I would also ask is, did you know you were poor? Yeah. Sometimes you don't connect the two. Mm-hmm. So if you would ask me if I knew I was poor, I might have said no. Growing up, I might not have known I was poor. I knew I was living in the projects. Um, afterwards, yes, I knew when I went to college that I was poor um, mm. and that there was this big cultural divide because every projects that I lived in, I lived in the communities and neighborhoods that were poor. Yeah. So I lived among people who were like me. Um, mm-hmm. So when, it's, when I got to the point where I lived among people, or I interacted on a more regular basis with people who are unlike me is when I realized, oh, okay, yeah, mm-hmm. that's the poverty. You know, I lived in poverty. Um, yeah. So that to me is, is the big difference. But I did see enough, of, and, and we had a very um, abusive household. So I lived in a household that was very abusive. So, my, so I knew, I guess knew early on that life had to be better than this. That mm-hmm. this, this just, this wasn't supposed, this, this wasn't what it had to be. Yeah. Um, did you, and, were you raised with both of your parents? Mm-hmm. I was, um, and I had two siblings and, um, and a grandmother, you know, extended, extended family uh-huh. was, was nice there, but it was, I knew there was something, life had to be better. It had to be. And I, the only way I thought it was going to be better for me, the only way I thought I was going to get out of what I, had, I saw as being my path just living where I was living, living among who I was living, was education. So I know it's it's kind of a, a tired statement, I guess, or yeah. philosophy. Education is your route out. But I was so firm in believing that. And, I, and I, I'm and i talking elementary school. Who planted knew, that in you? Like, how did you know that it was education? How did you take education seriously when you grew up around poor people who probably, um, I don't know what what the education system was like where you grew up, but how did you know that? Like, this is my ticket out. For A, you knew that there was a way out. It had B, to be. You knew, you knew you were probably going to find it. <laughs> and C, you're like, yep, this is it. <laughs> this is the train I'm riding. I know. I think it was more hope. I was like, this is the, there's got to be a way out. I hope. You know, I hope yeah. there's a better life for me than this. Because I didn't think I'd survive. Um, I want to say, I think maybe my got a little bit from it from my mother. Um, because she she valued education mm-hmm. and and then some kind of people in my life early on just early teachers who just said we were me and my brother were were just good kids and we yeah. you know we were destined for, for greatness so they spoke life to they, us mm-hmm. and my brother he was he was just naturally brilliant smart and because of that I saw this is probably too. I saw him getting accepted to like special programs because he was smart. And I was like, Oh, what? You got to, you know, go this and do that. And yeah, um, that's the way. Yeah. So I think those experience combined had me believe more strongly that education was going to be my way out Mm. of the projects and the life that it kind of can produce. Mm-hmm. Is that what spurred your passion and wanting to 
think more about education from a give back perspective and community from a give back perspective? Not so much education, but community. Um, mm. Cause I didn't consider the education till later on, like going to teach. Um, I would say I saw education being my, my way out because going, looking back, you can see how many people didn't complete education, didn't graduate from high school, didn't even go to college and remained in the neighborhood. And he's like, okay, yeah, see, this is, this is working. I'm actually yep. going, I'm on a whole different track than my peers. And not that it didn't come with challenges, especially in college, it, you know, it was challenging. The cultural um, exposure was more challenging than the academic exposure, actually. Really? And, yeah, it was. Where, where, where did you go to college? I went to Fordham University. It's where is that? The Bronx, but it's in uh-huh. the northern. I lived in the South Bronx, so it's the northern. So white? Bronx. Are we saying white? Is that what we're? Oh saying? yeah, very, um, very white. Um, Jesuit uh, upper class. Yes. Economically different class level. Oh yes. So um, very well, well known Jesuit university. Just, uh-huh. So it's. Oh, we, what was it Jesuit? I think Loyola is the sister university out here. So Jesuit. Okay. Okay. Um. But it was in, if, if you're anyone's familiar with the Bronx, it's on Fordham Road. Uh, so main drag for shopping and just still part of the neighborhood, if you will. Uh-huh. But every time I, I mean, literally, like, when I walk through the gates of Fordham, I moved from being the majority in my neighborhood to minority. And that physical feeling, the the sense that I received in sometimes in community with others or in the community with others um, was real. It was yeah. real. And then I will walk up, you know, walk out and I'm fine again. I'm like, oh yeah, this is familiar to me. I walked yeah. really out at a desk, uh, the gates, it wasn't. So I had to deal with that because that was the first time I had ever been in um, a frequent interaction with Caucasians. Other, you know, mm-hmm. the other Caucasians I interacted with the most were either maybe usually people of authority. So teachers or employers. Mm -hmm. So that was that cultural divide was real. I remember a few years back, I, they, I was part of another mentorship program and they asked me to give my story. And one of my, part of my stories growing up, in Aurora, but then my mom used a fake address, so we went to Naperville schools since third grade. So I always kind of lived in this dual world of like Aurora, Naperville, Mexican, white, poor, rich. It was really black or white for kids, yeah. right? And I remember when I'm talking to this lady and she's kind of writing down my thing and she, and the theme of my overall story, and I didn't know this at the time, I just learned it after she would you know, restated it to me. She's like, so did you grow up feeling second class? And I'm like, yeah, I think so. Because I knew in Aurora, I didn't ever think about that. I never thought I was different. I never thought I was less than in Naperville. I always knew I was different. I always knew I lived in the, the apartments, not the house. I didn't have the money. So I felt that, but it was perceived. It was like, um, no, nobody made me feel that way in Naperville ever. Mm -hmm. Like that I can remember no one ever looked down on me from that. I think I I perceived that. Um, And it was such a, I don't want to say wound, but like if we're talking about healing and stuff, it was such a deep thing for me that I I told her, scrap my story. I don't want to be part of it. I don't want to talk about this. Like I didn't want to acknowledge like, man, I did grow up feeling that way. I grew up thinking in this area that I wasn't good enough ever. And I would never be good enough. I didn't have, I, I, I don't know why either. My question to you is when you started going to your school and it turned out to be an all white school and you noticed the differences, is that something that you've also experienced? I'm curious to understand, is this something that a lot of minorities deal with when they go to a school that is different mm-hmm. uh, and, and pred- you know, predominantly white? Um, or I, I'm, I'm trying to understand if that's, maybe an experience that you also shared well, or was it something a little, different? A little different in that um, I was made also to feel different as well. So at Fordham 
and, I, and other universities as well. They have programs called either Equal Opportunity Program or Higher Equal Opportunity Program. So I remember the college fairs and I was going to all these schools and you know, interested in applying like NYU and, and the like. And um, they would ask me, how were, were you, they wouldn't ask it this way, but essentially they're asking, are you poor? Check that mm -hmm. box. And are your grades somewhat subpar? Check that box. So I would go and I say, you know, yeah, I am poor. So yeah, give me some you know, money. Yeah. yeah. But I got great grades. You know, so, so um, I couldn't check both boxes. So I wasn't eligible for EOP because I wasn't academically and financially disadvantaged. So I was, I had to go a different route. But at Fordham, anyone, well, anyway, and I'm overgeneralizing, so I'm, I, yeah. I admit, but I myself, because I was a person of color, automatically grouped into the EOP program because the only people who were in EOP were people of color. So though they would, so they would see me not only as poor, mm -hmm. but ac so economically different or uh, disadvantaged, but academically different and disadvantaged or less than. Yeah. So I would have to correct people. Oh, you're with the HEOP program. You're with the HEOP program. I said, no, I'm not with the HEOP program. I've got student loans that I have to pay just so that I can be here because I am academically at par with you. So I think the, the impact that that had on me, uh, it's long, it was longstanding. It's, it's yeah. not only not necessarily not feeling that you belong, that was big feeling that you mm -hmm. didn't belong. You found your little cluster of people that made you feel comfortable to go, but it was the, how do I, I have to prove myself. It's the yeah. proving yourself. I had to prove myself that I am academically at par. I'm even smart. Smarter right. than you. Yeah. Because um, I had to earn my way into the school. So <laughs> just got paid their way in, right? I had to earn my yeah. way in. Um, so, and I think that stayed with me quite some time into my adulthood. It's having to prove, having to feel that I have to prove my, my value. Yeah to others who would be willing and ready to discount me just because of how I look yeah, or my surname. Now, would you look at it now as an advantage? Would you look at yourself now and compare yourself to not just people who you grew up with, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but also your peers here and say, man, I have an advantage. I'm hungry. I work, I don't stop, uh, whatever that is for you, do you ever see that the benefit of, of the struggle of having to prove yourself? Would you say that it turned out to be beneficial um, in any way? I think it became part of who I was, I'm supposed to be in this world. Mm. And I think God puts certain experiences in our lives to prepare us. And if in so many different ways. If I didn't have the story that brought me out of the projects to even be a grout college graduate and everything that's happened um, there, I wouldn't be in particular communities where I can talk about it and I can share insight when things are being decided as mm -hmm. to how do you help. But it's also on the other end, it's understanding what people are experiencing and how they may respond to what can be identified as ways to fix things so that there's mm -hmm. I hope a little more sensitivity to the things that I propose or I introduce or I get involved in because I try to have both at least have some way of looking at both sides of the coin being someone mm -hmm. that experienced it but also knowing if these things were in place maybe life wouldn't have been as hard mm -hmm. so um, so I, I would say it's an advantage in the sense that I'm using it to try to, to provide a, a different scenario for, for other people who are growing up or living in, certain, in similar situations or circumstances. Like there's a sense of, of confidence and empowerment that I get from you. And I want to know, where do you get that from? Like, where did, was it, was it through education? Like, I am smart. I'm smarter than you and you and you and you, <laughs> right? Was that, or was it inherent? Was it, how, does, how did you get that? I would, well, first I would say my interest in the work that I 
that I do, it's been longstanding. It's, I mean, I think it's how I've been made, right? Because even <laughs> as a young kid, just the things that I would do that other people wouldn't do um, was looking out for someone else and trying to help someone else, even in the smallest way. And then it just got bigger in when I got exposed to different groups and organizations. And now it's not just me helping a friend or, or helping a, a teammate, it's helping a community. So getting mm-hmm. involved in community organizing at a younger, a younger age, just continue to build skills. And I think it's just the, a, a lifetime of experiences and opportunities that has, and, and, and maturity got me to a point where I'm at today. Um, where And then the older I get, the more I'm like, you know, I really don't care what you think. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing. You know, I, I yeah. don't, you know, if you feel that I'm less than you, that's your problem. That's right. not my problem. Mm-hmm. Whereas four years ago, I was like, I care so much. I can't, I'm not going to mentor people. I don't want to share my story. Mm-hmm. I'm done. <laughs> right. You know, like I, it's like a growth process. So when you reach a stage of difficulty, of personal challenge, how do you talk to yourself? What is it that you do to fill yourself or continue pushing through those moments that an, or another person might stop? Mm-hmm. Another person might say, I'm done. Mm-hmm. What is it that you tell yourself to keep pushing through? I would, I would say I don't try to go through those challenges by myself. Mm. And that's, a, that's probably a bigger uh, level of, of change because I would always focus on how I can fix it. I am very in, independent to a fault where mm. I didn't seek help. I would just do it. And a lot of it was based on my childhood, not really being able to depend on anyone to take care of me. So I had to do it myself. And then people started looking to me for for dependence. And then I had to take care of other people. So I there was no one I felt could really help me. So I always had to be able to help myself. Now I'm at a point where if I'm going through a challenge, I seek out help. And I seek out help from people that I know who will give me godly advice. So I mm-hmm. seek out help. I'll talk to things, uh, talk to my husband, I'll talk through things with my husband. Um, there's several other people that will talk through things and then pray. And I think that in combination has gotten me to a point where even if the struggle continues or the challenge continues, I find myself moving more towards peace with it than anxiety. Usually when mm-hmm. I was trying to fix things all by myself, it, it's, it's, I was a tight wall of stress all the time. Now mm-hmm. it's being able to, to, to have more perspective. you doing things by yourself. You only see things from one lens. Mm-hmm. You work through with other people. At least you have other ways to look at a problem that you never thought about before. And, um, it's been easier to manage through crises that way in the latter part of my life than in the earlier part when I didn't think Mm -hmm. anybody would help me or could help me. What brought you to that place of, of surrender Mm -hmm. after being so self resilient, self reliant, but that's a hard transition for a lot of people. I know for me, it's very hard. Yeah. um, I would say it really became, it started off with me and faith and the, the stronger my faith became, the easier it was for me to develop the um, the approach of, of working with others and wanting to get insight from others. Then taking that to work and to mm. community. So um, to me, the other way around would be uh, too sterile uh, because I wouldn't have seen where the, the me is in that the person, you know, the characteristics of me in building a team and then, oh, well, I, I need a team in my personal life. But that's very, to me, it's a very different relationship. Um, mm-hmm. So so I think it became, it, it started with 
the change in me first, and then I brought it to my different spaces, like my personal space, my workspace. Yeah. And because it was the same with my workspace. It's it's knowing that either it's not designed to provide the help or the help is just really isn't there or I, I don't want to put burdens, a lot of it too, burden on someone else to help me when I know they probably have their own thing. That would, used to be my biggest rationalization. Like, oh, I don't want to ask someone. They've got all their work, their own work to do. And why would, why should I ask them right. to help me and stop what they need to do? And I'll just, I'll just figure it out. Now, yeah. it's, oh, you know, I think you got the answer. I know you got the answer. Yeah. It'd be quicker to get from you and know that you can call me if there's an answer I have and it'd be quicker to get it from me. That to me took time to get even at the workplace. But yeah. it's the same kind of concept that I got from, you know, I'm not going to call my friend and just have her help me, you know, work, help me work through this issue and stand the phone with me for an hour. But don't we tell ourselves this all the time? Huh? Right. So how I said, we tell ourselves this all the time as moms and as women in general, like, ah, I don't want to, I don't want to talk about this or I don't want to call them. What do you tell your, like, what is, if I said, Adrian, I don't want to call you because of this. What would you tell me? How do we build that? amongst each other now Mm -hmm. and I think because I to your point that's so important I know personally I have had many lunch conversations with you like Adrian (laughs) right and they help and I can't go and have those same conversations with this anyone Mm -hmm. I Mm -hmm. need someone who I trust and respect who's in a different phase who also has a more experience how do we build that now Mm -hmm. I agree I think it's tough I think it's tough um because we not only are not necessarily in the kind of community that we were in before at different times, but we fill sometimes those free opportunities with more busyness. So we never have the time, right? And I think that's one thing that this COVID experience has, has brought. It's, a, it's to me, and I say it to other people and they agree, but it's been like a reset where yeah. All of a sudden, you can't do anything. So let's yeah, you have do nothing what but time. can do, and <laughs> and we get we've developed the opportunity to connect differently, and maybe even more. And and if not, maybe just with ourselves and reflect mm-hmm. um, what is important. Or that's going to get done whenever it gets done, and life's not going to end because it didn't get done today. You know, having just a whole different mindset of what living really should be. So I think. Letting, giving us our own time and space mm-hmm. and know that that's okay to, to use that for ourselves um, is one thing. And to know, and, and you asked me, you know, I want to answer this. Um, what would I say to you if you were to call me or, or you say, oh, I don't want to bother you. And I would, I would want to underscore that I love you, Andrea. And if you understood what that love is and I hope I make you feel that you are and that I uh, hope that you trust me in that way. Just like when my daughter calls me or stops in to talk, unless there's something that's like crazy pressing, I'm going to talk to her. Mm -hmm. I will make that time for you. And I think that's where in, in an effort to build that community, it's being true to that. Mm-hmm. So if I say, yeah, Angie, you can call me whenever. Don't ever, don't ever worry about it. Don't ever hesitate. Um, only probably a medical crisis is going to stop <laughs> at this point, right? Unless um, you need money, do not. No, don't call me if you need money. <laughs> well, if you need money, I might be able to point you in the right direction. I might not be able to call Adrian. <laughs> but, um, but I think... If we, if we are that for each other, right, and 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 it makes it easier. Mm-hmm. So I had a situation um, that I was, I don't say it's a really situation. It's not well, a situation, I guess, that I was dealing with, and and I'm just going through my mind. And I said, you know, let me just text my friend and say, hey, you know, do you have a minute to call? I just want to talk to you about this. Said, sure, and it was an hour and a half conversation and she was just listening to me and sharing insight and in and that would have been something I would not have done maybe five years ago. It's like, oh, I want to bug her. I know, you know, maybe I'll catch up with her sometime, whatever. 
But I said, no, I'm going to, you know, this is, I know this person loves me and I love her and you know, I know she's there for me and I'm there for her. And this is a time when I, I, I just need someone else's perspective. And, mm. and I got it and it was wonderful conversation and I ended it with the, you know, some great insight and helped me through that. Otherwise yeah. I would have just been going through it in my mind, something that you know, I talked to my husband, but you know, that's a different angle. You have to talk to a woman sometimes or a mother sometimes to get, yeah. you know, that, that to me is what will change the way we as women really develop a sisterhood. That to me is yeah. sisterhood, and, but mm-hmm. we have to practice it in, on a regular basis. So yeah, make those calls and then you'll know, you'll know when someone truly is your sister and when someone is a, an acquaintance and that's and something we teach Janae and not everyone is going to be your, your friend and yeah. not everyone is going to be an acquaintance and not everyone is going to be a colleague. I mean, you, you place people in those categories based on how you're able to relate to them and how they relate to you. Not that mm-hmm. one's bad or one's good, but they're mm-hmm. just different. So I can yeah. have fun with an acquaintance, but I'm not going to call my acquaintance when I have a really major issue or a big right. secret. I'm going to call a good friend and Mm -hmm. and vice versa. So that, I guess that comes with time too. When you think of your life and the people who shaped you, who are those people for you that helped you, molded you, influenced you, good or bad? Mm -hmm. Who are those people? Um, I would start with my mother, a very smart woman. Um, but very broken. Mm. And so I learned a lot from her and because of her. So that helped shape me. My grandmother, very independent, strong. So I learned a lot from her that shaped me as well. And then other kind of mentors in my life who I've just admired their fortitude and, and the the barriers that they could, um, knocked down as, as they progressed through life. And I learned, I learned that I learned probably risk taking a lot from there. Um, who do you look up to? Who do I look up to? Yeah. I don't think there's just one person. I think that there's, there's a maybe more of a type of the people that I tend to look up to. Okay. Um, uh, people have such a strong sense of faith and core. Mm. The core of them is, is a strong sense of, of faith. I really do admire that. I strive to be like that. Um, it's a significant work in progress. Um, I was sharing this with some friends, people who pray, but really pray. And that's the first thing they go to when they're in a, in a bind or in a, experiencing a challenge is, they go to prayer. And sometimes I'm going here and I'm going there and I'm going there. And then I think, oh, I should pray about this. It's a good idea. Mm-hmm. So I admire people like that. Um, yeah. I admire my husband who has this, uh, this way about him. He's just this personality and, the, and it just draws people to him. And I admire that. I, I know that's one of his strengths. And um, not that I feel I can be like him that I could be more like him than less like him so it's something Mm. that I work towards um, but it's just natural to him yeah he's that way way to connect with people so I do admire that um I think there's just a bunch of different things that I admire and I find it I find it in different people when you're rising and you're which is what you're doing, right? You're rising and you're creating on a different level. There's a lot of uh, pushback at times. And you, you, you're also in a position where you're leading a lot of men. Do you find that that dynamic is different that when you're starting to deal with powerful men or men who have significant power um, as a woman in being able to rise how do you navigate that dynamic? Is that ever been an issue for you? Do you ever think about that? Like, 
uh, in terms of just gender differences? I, well, I think, yeah, in every space, there's going to be uh, gender differences that's going to exist because you're still in a male oriented and dominated society from an employment standpoint and career standpoint, men still hold the lion's share of major powerful positions in our country. That's, that's the reality. Women still earn less to the dollar in, in employment than men and career than in men. That's still the reality. Um, I think in different employment experiences I've had, my uh, interaction and the results of that have varied. In the nonprofit world, um, probably more equalized. Mm-hmm. But I didn't feel too much of a... Uh, of a distance between myself and my male colleagues, um, even those who were at higher levels than myself at the time. I've, in academia, it's very pronounced, the gender differences in, in pay and in acceptance. Um, I've experienced that you know, even prejudice as a result of just being a woman in that space mm-hmm. and comments that were made um, and were not made as, as I was trying to move along that trajectory and knowing that that was a common occurrence. So you then find your colleagues in that academic career space who have had those similar experiences of how you band together to to support one another, move towards tenure eventually. And then, but in the public sector, I think it's been interesting because you have, at least where I'm at, you have a a nice mix in terms of gender. there is still opportunity in the hierarchy for more women to be represented. So right now, if you look at the org chart, we have a female chief of police. We have myself as chiefs in leadership, in the, the highest leadership position outside of the chief of staff and the mayor mm-hmm. um, in that org. So though you have a number of women who work in the public sector, it's still, how do they ascend to higher levels and get that same level of authority? That to me, that point is authority. Um, there's room and, for improvement there too. And how do you do that, right? Is it through building alliance and building that network of other women who help propel and, and uplift and support or um, have you also relied on male mentors, male allies? And then if so, how, how do you continue to build that for other people? Mm-hmm. I think um, in government, it can be a little more challenging because you have limited number of positions in higher level leadership um, in the structure. But then you also tend to have people stay a little bit longer in government positions. So if you compare that to corporate, where the expectation in corporate is that you're going to, you are going to promote. If, if you don't promote within a certain number of years, then you need to go to another company because the, the expectation is to promote to these higher levels of, mm-hmm. of within an organization. You don't, but that is only possible as other people vacate those positions. Right? So if people right. are staying in those positions too long, then the ability for someone to move up is is hindered. They either they're probably going to end up having to move out. So in yeah. government, people stay in these positions a bit longer because after a certain period of time, I think there's we're trying to figure out what that number is. I think there's there's a magic number that after you've worked in government for a certain number of years, you're just not going to go anymore. Yeah, um, and it could be becoming vested in the retirement program, or you're close to being retiring yourself, and it doesn't make sense. I mean, reality does click in. So government, it gets a little, it's a little more challenging. Um, what I would say is you always want to seek out mentors. And those are the people who can provide you insight on how to navigate, how to navigate the political structure, which is very evident in, in government. But also you need to find what we call sponsors. You know, sponsors is, is a much more um, intentional relationship where that person is going to place you where you need to be so that you can move on forward and be your constant advocate in that organization for your success. I and love that. Yes, yeah, mentor is someone who's just going to give you guidance and advice. The sponsors, like I'm taking you. So we need more sponsors. That's what we need, more sponsors. Because I've heard of this. We, we know what mentors are, right? 
a little bit more distance, far removed, not necessarily understanding the day-to-day -day operations of what you're specifically going through, but nonetheless helpful guidance and, and in a position that you want to be essentially, right? And then there's the coach who is like, that's like the manager, the day-to-day, -day, I'm going to make you faster, make you stronger. And then that sponsor. I want to be a sponsor. <laughs> Right, right, right. Um, so t talk to me about what you're willing to, what does that, what is, a, what is a sponsor and how can you help other people as a sponsor? Someone who's going to open the doors for you. It's more than just a, an introduction. It's, it's someone who's going to sell you as more than you would sell yourself. So it's someone who is going to um, understand where you want to go help you understand whether or not that makes sense. So there's the guidance and mentorship part of that too. And then help you plan out how to get there and be with you every step of the way, making sure that they're helping you connect with who you need to connect with, doing those advanced um, conversations before you have them, um, helping you move to those positions that are along that career trajectory, whether it's with that company or not, because your sponsor may be at your company, may not be at your company. It could be where you right. want to go. But that sponsor is willing to open their network, their their address, right? Their Access. contact book mm -hmm. and say, okay, Andrea, this is where you want to go. I know these people in this industry and they work here, 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 and there. We're going to have a, have a coffee with them. I schedule this for this month. Every month we're going to meet someone new. I'm going to send out an email and let them know I want them to meet with you and this is why and and this is the dates that we would like for it to happen. And then yeah. the follow-up. Hey, how did you like that conversation with Andrea? What do you think we should be doing next? Someone who's there marketing you because yeah. they know you can do some great things in those next places. That's, that's what we need people more people to do is help yeah. to open those doors because they're there where the doors are right so that's but that's also taking you know note that we don't have as many people in those spaces right in those positions that can open many many doors but once you're yeah. there I think we have that responsibility mm -hmm. to answer you're one of those people you are one of those people and then having connections and access and it, just even the heart like what you said earlier you were made for this like this is why you're here right mm -hmm. who else is made for this I don't I don't know a lot of people who are made to help others and to lead on high levels I want to find them <laughs> but I think you know you're one of them they're pl I'm in good company. There are plenty of people who focus on help, you know, have as part of their livelihood or their life a part that's to help others. And they're in different ways, though. And I think that's the piece there, too. It's like not everybody can, can be a sponsor, but that doesn't mean that they're not out there trying to help others in right. a different way. Mm -hmm. But I love that concept of sponsor. Mm -hmm. I do. All right. Well, Adrian, thank you for your time. Thank you for being a guest. Thank you for sharing your insight with us. And um, I would love to hear more from you later on the show um, and to have you come back and, and continue to teach us. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. I'd love to come back and just chat. <laughs> Before we go, is there anything else that you want to share with the audience? Anything that you um, want to make sure you land before we close? I mean, we talked about a lot of different things. Um, I think what I would want to land on is just encouraging people. I think that part of asking for guidance, asking for help, and then also making yourself available to someone else, you know, to build that community of sisters, mm -hmm. that would I would ask people to really consider how they can be part of a movement like that. Yeah. And, and it doesn't have to be big. It can just be your, your small group, but it requires people to take initiative um, and to put themselves out there. 
uh, both as receiving assistance and giving assistance. Mm-hmm. So I would I would love to land with let's build a uh, sisterhood. Let's build a sisterhood, soul to soul, sister to sister, heart to heart. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love that. I love that. All right. We're going to follow up on that the next time. Okay. And um, thank you for visiting. And then where can people find you and more information about Thrive? Uh, Thrive Collaborative Center has its website. So it's thrivecollaboratorcenter.org. And uh, you can send an email out there if you want some more information on what we're doing. But we try to post a lot of our activities and events and membership information as well. And then I'm at the city of Aurora. So my email is aholloway at aurora-il.org. Thank you for listening to Tuesdays with Andrea. There are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, and I appreciate you making the time to listen to mine. If you like this show and want to know more, check out TuesdaysWithAndrea.com or please leave a review on iTunes or drop a line in the YouTube comment section. Until next time, please stay kind in your mind, nice on the web, and stay hella hopeful in your heart.